<laughs> Coming in under braking, stuffing it in. Oh yes, maybe we're turning it up a little bit here. We gotta have fun once in a while, right? <laughs> oh yes, yes. This is what I like. This thing is insane. We were just cruising around in electric mode. And now we're up here absolutely shredding the piss out of this car. Hello and welcome to another out of spec reviews video. Welcome here to beautiful California and welcome to the Polestar 1. You guys know we have reviewed this car on this channel. We've had it on track. We've done range tests and charging tests. And now it's time to say goodbye and bring in the new wave of Polestar. We've of course done a lot with Polestar 2, but now after three years, Polestar 1 has reached the end of the production line and Polestar will be a fully electric company moving forwards. However, we should go for a final drive in this car and some incredible roads and definitely give it a nice, solid farewell. Just as a reminder, Polestar 1 is, of course, the first car under Polestar's name, hence the 1. Then we'll have the 2, the 5, the etc. And, well, let's talk about the powertrain because the real special part of this car is how it's actually propelled down the road. It's built on Volvo's SPA platform, the SPA architecture. So they had a pretty good starting base, but then they reinforce things with carbon fiber. They have active air, well not active air, but arrow through the bodywork, if you will, down through places like this, drain holes, things like that. Just an insane amount of detail put in this car. Really nice carbon fiber here on the front. It's a little bit of a mix between a GT with a bit of sporty flair. They use the same two liter four cylinder engine that makes now 300 26 horsepower compared to the usual 306 or 316 depending on tuning applications on the Volvo side. It's turbocharged and supercharged. The supercharger is really a low-end boost functionality. The It actually disconnects and decouples at around 3,000 RPM. I forget the exact RPM, but essentially it's just to get it up and running. Then you're working on turbocharging from there. You can see a little bit of a carbon fiber air intake there. That's quite interesting. You have some high voltage connections under here, perhaps onboard charger, things like that. We'll talk about charging here in a second but up front that's what's powering it basically the four-cylinder engine is in no way connected to the rear wheels you also have a pancake motor an isp like a little uh, you know integrated starter motor on the back side of the engine that's between the transmission and the engine that also acts as a boost to basically help free up some uh, I should say spin up the crankcase a little bit to get the, uh, the four cylinder a little bit of an extra boost, which is nice. It can also act as a generator to charge the battery pack. It has the 35 kilowatt hour battery pack kind of sandwiched back here. So the weight balance is pretty far rearward. You also have J1772 charging port and CCS. So it can DC fast charge, which is very interesting. And I think we should stop and try that at an Electrify America station along the way today. And of course, I've done a full zero to 100% charging test on this car. It does about 50 kilowatt peak. It's actually not a bad charging curve, believe it or not. Now we can talk about sort of the need to have DC charging on a plug-in hybrid or not, but I'd say, hey, if you can do it, may as well. I'm going to show you something pretty neat back here as well. Oop, that's the fuel one. This is the trunk one. Here we go. Take a look at this. So Polestar was pretty transparent in their high voltage connections with this absolutely beautiful display back here. You can see AC charging connections, DC buses, things like this that are all sort of on display. And it's a nice thing to show, of course, at a car show, you can pop the hood to see the four cylinder and open the trunk to see some high voltage connections. You have the factory supplied uh, sort of onboard, uh, I should say EVSC. It actually clips in over here to this little connection right there more or less but overall it's got to be one of the most complicated drive lines of any car soft closed trunk which is nice two individual rear motors i believe they're about 75 kilowatts each about 157 kilowatts on the rear axle something like that plus or minus uh can do torque vectoring as well which is pretty sweet we'll certainly try that out uh, a few different drive modes, everything from fully electric mode to a power mode that keeps all systems engaged all the time. I've always had an issue with some of these plugs per se. Interior spec on this is just absolutely lovely. It's the traditional Polestar gold seat belts, which I love. It has the Aki Bono brakes. I think the Polestar 2 gets the Brembo's Olean suspension. We're going to be driving the car in comfort mode today, so it's going to be more of a GT drive. We'll see if we can turn it up a little bit. But you guys know I'm a huge Swede speed kind of guy. I love this. Can't wait to go for a drive in it. It's a four seat, two door, absolute special machine here. And if you ever see one on the road in the future, 
tag me in a photo because yeah, this is one of my all time favorites. Let's jump in and go for a drive. Welcome to the inside of the Polestar 1 and what a bittersweet day this is. For those who don't know, I'm, you know, obviously a big Volvo guy. Polestar, again, not Volvo, but I just think that this was the pinnacle of the SPA1 chassis. Uh, Volvo Group's now working on SPA2. I don't know if that will work its way over to Polestar, perhaps with the 5, I'm not sure, but I will say in terms of the chassis that I would say saved Volvo back in with the XC90 and all of those cars when they redesigned everything. I want to say 2016. This was the pinnacle. It has carbon fiber reinforcements everywhere. It's just the most bespoke, crazy thing ever. And there's so few of them. This event actually is the most amount of Polestar ones ever to be in one place. So it's just absolutely amazing to see all of the cars here. There was about 15 of them is the entire press and marketing fleet. This particular one that we're driving is a very, very early production car. It's VIN 15 something and, um, or 150, I should say, <laughs> you know, it's like one of the first few. They didn't go fully in sequential order, but let's go into drive, into B mode, which increases off throttle regen. You have the crystal shifter, of course. Um, the thing here is I always thought that if Polestar never became a thing, this would have been perfect for the Volvo lineup. And essentially, it's, it's, there's no different in this car. Everything in here is just Volvo with a Polestar badge. So uh, we're letting one of our friends go out first in theirs. We're going to keep it in pure mode to start, which uses the electrical system. That's power. Let's go to pure. There we go. And there's pure. So essentially, what we're going to do is just cruise along in silence and let it go we'll say thanks to those guys for letting us have a final drive of the polestar one before they retire the cars this particular one i don't know if they're going to keep it or if it's going now to go left and then turn oh right. we got to shut this lady off how do we do that how do i turn her off navigation settings route and guidance route guidance level none thank you there we go um, now in terms of this particular car, which this was the only one there without matte paint, it essentially is going to go into either the heritage collection or into uh, the hands of a customer. But because this one's still a very early car, I think they were saying it can't be sold with a paint warranty or some exclusion or something like this, which I find very, you know, I just love the weird odd stuff with these cars. They're built in such limited numbers in a bespoke factory in China. And yeah, it's just totally the full, like just give all of the Swedish engineers the power to do what they want. Essentially, it's the Lexus LFA of Volvo Group, if you will, of Geely. So let's cruise around here in Santa Barbara. Wow, wrapped Model Y. And got my Starbucks. This car is a GT. So in terms of the way the powertrain is set up, right now we're driving in electric mode. So we'll start with how the electrical system works. And you can drive this car fully as an EV. It has DC fast charging the whole bit. So we have two electric motors on the rear axle making about uh, just under 160, I think it's 157 kilowatt peak output from the rear. Two electric motors, uh, at both making 150 kilowatts, is it? Or they're both 70. I think they're both 75-ish kilowatts following a nice e-tron GT in front of us. And uh, this car, look, I like the e-tron GT, but this thing is just so much cooler than that. And uh, <laughs> basically the, uh, the rear axle is capable of torque vectoring. So individual motors are not connected uh, through an axle so they can power the outside of the rear motor, for example, coming out of corner like this. And we're just sitting at wide open throttle. Yeah, it feels about 150 kilowatts or so. And uh, in total, this car makes 617 horsepower. So you have the 35-ish kilowatt hour battery pack uh, arranged into three stacks, two separate battery packs though. And um, that is then paired with a uh, two liter, four cylinder, supercharged and turbocharged engine, normally making 316 horsepower, I think in the Volvo stuff. 
and here makes 326 so it's got like a real hot tune on that uh, combustion engine and then there's an integrated starter motor like a pancake motor that's another 51 kilowatts so it's just like three electric motors plus turbocharging plus supercharging on the four cylinder it's the craziest drivetrain hodgepodge ever it's the parts bin special like I mentioned this is what happens when you let engineers go crazy and they have to take what they can to work with I mean and then the you know the body and material guys put carbon everywhere it's just you know we've reviewed this car I don't need to tell you everything about it but it really is just one of my favorite favorite vehicles it runs on the old census system you know everything's transitioning to Google operating system now and the car's pretty much done this is the final opportunity I'll probably ever have to drive a Polestar one and it's gonna be about a four-hour drive today through the hills in uh, California starting here in Santa Barbara doing a loop around some amazing driving roads and I uh, can't wait to share that drive with you right now I'm just starting in full electric mode since we're not shredding and driving in full electric mode is awesome it's so nice we have the let's see mail truck right here we got to squeeze around him a little bit of wheel spin there from the uh, inside rear tire needed more torque vectoring folks and we're just cruising along. Now, the nice thing about driving this car as an EV every day is you had the most amount of range of any plug-in hybrid when this vehicle launched. It still might be. I can't think of one off the top of my head that can go farther, but maybe there was. I think we did almost 70 miles on a charge. We've done a range test on this car, a highway range test, and uh, it actually didn't do poorly. That's on our Inside EVs channel. And then we also um, did a track test of this car on our One Lap channel. So we've done a lot with Fall Star One. I've taken it on a trip. Like I've spent a lot of time with this vehicle, and yeah, it's just just so. I keep saying it's so special, but it really, really, really is. And then you know the biggest thing here was the DC fast charging on the plug-in hybrid. So I have another video DC fast charging test on the plug-in system on here. It's one of the few. The new Range Rover has it. The Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid and Polestar One has it. Also the Karma Rivero has it. Um, that's more of a range extended situation though. And. Look at this road we're on, shredding it even in electric mode. <laughs> That's awesome. I got the Olean set in full comfort because it's a street drive. And, you know, they get real aggressive when you turn them up. We turned them up for the track, and this thing is real stiff and hoppy when you have the uh, damper set up. It's a manual adjustment, uh, so you have to actually jack the rear to change it, and I just love the crazy stuff. That, thankfully, carries through for Polestar 2, which is probably, like, you know just a daily driver for a lot of people but by the way you got to jack up the car to adjust your suspension i love the uh love the level of uh you know effort you need to put in to change the car and get it set up for your preferences so as an ev this is how we're starting it uh i think we'll do like three different modes we'll do the the electric vehicle section we'll do the hybrid section and then we'll do the performance section at the end because this car truly is good at being an electric daily driver a gt grand tourer and you can drive it hard, although maybe that's, from my memory, its weakest point, but that's okay. We will try it all, the final drive of the Polestar 1. And then in electric mode, I get good regen off throttle. When I hit the brake pedal, it blends more. And we're still at about 90% state of charge, and I got regen from the start. So, you know, there's a little bit of a top buffer. It may not have been 100, 100% charged, but really good regen in B mode. And yeah, you can pretty much one pedal drive this thing. Let's just stick it into the corner. Big power, hit the brakes. Oh yes, even driving quickly here in full electric mode. <laughs> even when you get wheel slip, the guy in front of us is trying to go quick, but guess what? We're catching up, big power, drifting. Hell yeah, let's go baby. I want ESC Sport. How do I do that again, actually? So I got to go here to settings, my car. No, that's not right. I got to hit, I got to slide the screen and then I got to hit ESC Sport mode. There we go. Now we're in ESC Sport and electric mode coming in under braking. Can we slide it in electric mode? Big power. Nope. <laughs> Big power. Yes, sir. We can. We can get little slip angles out of corners. That's awesome. Big power. Yep. <laughs> Full EV sends here in the Polestar 1, baby. <laughs> Just whop, whop, whop. 
Oh, this is so cool. What is this machine? It's a Swedish crazy hand built machine and we're sliding it around in full electric mode. <laughs> Even at low speed, it's so slick, this surface, that you just go to the kick down switch and you can just pivot the rear axle around. I just absolutely want this car so bad. It's so good looking. Coming in, big power. Yeah, I think maybe the electric motors are starting to get a little toasty from that. <laughs> I'll see you when we do some GT hybrid driving. Before we get into the hybrid driving, I'd like to talk a little bit about a topic that genuinely keeps me up at night, and that is the powertrain calibration on the combustion side of hybrids and plug-in hybrids, specifically when they are so under-stressed, like, or over-stressed, like this, uh, you know, two-liter supercharged and turbocharged engine, then it has to, you know, sometimes just start up and go. And now, I've always been under the impression that, look, you don't want to start a combustion engine and just let it you know, run there for 10 minutes before you drive it. But you know, you give it 10, 20 seconds, build up some oil pressure, get the things flowing, and then, you know, drive it gently until it's at operating temperature and then rip on it. And something that really feels so mechanically abusive to me is when I drive these plug-in hybrids and stuff and I go past the point, especially in hybrid mode, when it switches from electric to combustion. And then it could be a stone cold engine at zero degrees Fahrenheit and just whoa, fires into life and has to go. Now I've done some tests with this engine, not in the Polestar, but on the Volvo side, uh, XC90, XC60, for example, in really cold temperatures and watching how the engine sort of is calibrated to handle that. And this is different than those cars. And I think it's because it makes more electric power on the rear axle. So what I did, you know, just because I wanted to try the hybrid system, do like a little GT uh, little section, I wanted to warm everything up. So I put the car into power mode, which forces the combustion engine to stay on, uh, which is purely connected to the front axle, by the way. And what it did was it just sat at cold startup, you know, 1500 RPM doing the uh, emission system warm up type situation. And my throttle applications were still just running the, um, the electric motor. So it was just sitting there warming up as I was driving. I've never seen that behavior from a Volvo plug-in hybrid be just because the electric motor can't make that much torque. And I thought that was probably the least mechanically abusive way to warm up that combustion engine and get it going. Now I'm still driving it gently in power mode to get everything up and, and moving. I'll probably drive for another two or three minutes and then put it in hybrid mode. A lot of people won't do that, but keep in mind, these cars are cars that are special, that are not going to be recycled after five or 10 years. You'll see these in museums for 50, 60, 70 years. People will be like, remember how wild it was when this car was out. And I think part of, uh, you know, caring for a vehicle like this or driving it is to care for the combustion side and try and treat this four cylinder as gently as possible. So if I owned one, I would drive it in electric mode as much as possible. And when I knew I was going to drive it fast, I would put it in power mode, warm everything up and then drive it hard. I spoke to some of the engineers about this a year ago or so, and they said, yeah, that's probably the best way to do it um, for longevity. And so if you're thinking about buying a Polestar one, which I actually know some owners, um, uh, one owner in particular is a friend of mine, then I guess maybe this is my last drive, but it's my last drive, at least for now, then uh, yeah, maybe that's the best solution for you. Yeah, see, it's really revving out in power mode, 4,000 RPM, so the engine's probably fine. So let's go into hybrid everyday use. It's now switched back to electric. I have a little display here that says I can go on the throttle to uh, you know a point where I run out of my electric uh, acceleration, and then when I go past the little fuel droplet on the screen, then it will transition like this to combustion. And what a great little two liter it is. Let's drive a bit and then we'll talk about this car's long distance ability, shall we? Suspension on this car is really neat and let's talk about it a little bit more in depth. So uh, I mentioned that it has adjustable O-Leans dampers. So spring rate is set from the factory, but you do have adjustable uh, I don't know if it's rebound or compression. I want to say it's compression, but could be either way. Uh, by the way, let's just do a little bit of a launch, shall we? So it's been a little while. We have it in ESC Sport. Regen on, doesn't make a difference. Left foot to the floor, flooring it with the right, and go. It <laughs> smokes the tires, holy smokes. And full brakes. <laughs> this thing 
boogies once it gets traction. It's so funny because coming out of some corners over there, it has, you know, all of this rear torque that it can do. And then, you know, the engine's a little laggy because it's got to boost everything up and get, get things going. And then it just spins the front tires. It was a really wet surface. So you're like, power's nice. And then, oh, the front's spinning, but then the rear isn't because they're not connected. And it's the most unnatural sort of thing, but it works. And it's really fun because you're almost managing two different driveline systems with one accelerator pedal, which almost you are. And it's really a new sort of challenge to think about where the power is going, how the car is distributing it, especially when you turn back some of the traction control. I really enjoyed it. So right now I have the suspension set as mentioned in full comfort. What that means is the car's soft, it's gonna work, it's gonna let that, that suspension travel happen, it's going to slow down some of the wheel movements, or I should say the wheel movements are gonna be quicker, but it's gonna slow down some of it trying to catch it. So it shouldn't be as hoppy on the road. It's still quite firm compared to like a real cruiser. I'm gonna take it out of power mode now that we're finished shredding and go into hybrid. And now the combustion engine's off and we're cruising in silence. Um, <laughs> I forgot how fast this car was. Let's check, check now that everything's warmed up, this sort of lag period in hybrid from when we're just cruising at, let's just go 30 miles an hour, regen down roughly. So here's 30. I'm going to go past the kick down switch. So we'll get an initial hit from the electric motors, I imagine, and then the combustion engine will go. Big hit from the motors. Front engine goes. Whoa. <laughs> it moves and it's this sort of relentless torque and I love this four cylinder engine it's very agricultural sounding and there's so much going on but I've said this from the Volvo stuff to uh, you know every time I've driven this engine in this particular tune it's even tuned up more when you put the windows down you can hear the choppiness from the turbo you can it's just so interesting it's not necessarily a pleasant noise it doesn't encourage you to rev all the way out but up top it's pretty fruity and uh i just absolutely am enamored with this crazy drivetrain situation and well while we're here and we're in hybrid mode let's talk a little bit about hybrid mode and the gt ability of this car i don't expect to do much highway driving on this particular tour but uh let's talk about if you were to do a long distance in the car first of all trunk space is not massive and that's because there's a big battery pack back there which i showed you at the beginning of the video with all the cool connections and stuff so you have enough for a bag or two there's no front trunk obviously because there's a, a combustion engine under there so in terms of cargo space not much it is a four-seater and it actually isn't like terrible rear seats i don't think i would fit back there but for kids or you know larger people with no legs you could fit back there no problem and so uh yeah the headroom's not great either so no head or no torso and no legs you're good um yep either way pretty pretty nice to have the four seats i would use that as extra storage like i've done and as you heard things flying around the car when we slammed on the brakes before so good good interior comfort uh the seats are amazing they're basically the r design seats out of a, any you know volvo product steering wheels the uh thicker wheel which i quite um don't like <laughs> it's actually not bad in this particular one i just don't like the pebbled leather on the side i'm not a a dimpled leather or pebbled leather kind of guy I just like this smooth up top it does have heated seats heated steering wheel no air conditioned seats at least in this particular one i've never driven one with ventilated or ac seats i don't think they were available it does have the bowers and wilkins sound system which is good but um yeah really good system no question but it like when you get into an xc90 um, you know, that's a better system. You just have more uh, speakers, more cabin to, to, you know, boost air through. And I know I'm using not good audio terminology. It's a great system. You're not gonna complain about it. You can crank it up, put a little Fleetwood Mac on before. And that was, you know, very fitting for the environment we were in, I thought, and that, that was a nice, nice song, nice music to cruise to, I should say. So overall, in terms of, you know, your GT abilities, doing a road like this, doing winery tours, that's what the Polestar 1 really should be used for, is you and your significant other cruising around to places like this, in places like this, to do wine stuff. I don't know anything about wine, I just get the cheapest white wine I can find. Some of my friends know this, and um, yeah, that's just, it's just how I roll, but you know, the way I would drive the Polestar one is like on the tail of the dragon shredding the entire time because it's really freaking cool at that too. So as a GT, it's got 
good space for two people. What's funny is the cup holders are quite shallow because there's also a battery uh, situation under here in the center. So that's quite interesting. I think we're following in, yeah, it's an F-250 Super Duty uh, police truck. How about that? Huh, that's pretty sick. And yeah, we are in B mode. So B mode doesn't bring you all the way down to a stop, unfortunately. Let's roll into it a little bit more, get that combustion engine on just gently. What's so interesting is this car's tuned wonderfully for wide open throttle application. It's easy to tune for max throttle. It's everything in between with the combustion engine. It's always a little bit clunky and kind of odd. So it just likes to slam down and, and then go back to electric mode. Uh, we'll see if performance degrades over time. We're at 75% state of charge. The nice thing is uh, if you are cruising down the highway and you know you want to cruise around wineries and you want to uh, you know, go into a city, for example, it's totally possible to do that electric. If I go into the census system here and I swipe left, there's a few different powertrain control options that I have. The first is totally normal. It will use the electric systems as much as possible until they're out. And then it will transition to just sort of a regular hybrid situation. Then you can charge the battery. So it'll use that um, sort of integrated starter motor, that, that pancake motor on the back side of the engine to uh, charge up the battery pack. And I, I don't know how fast it charges, but I want to say like 30 or 40 kilowatts. And I've done this before and you just get such terrible fuel economy when that happens and things get hot and the engine's under stress, but you can charge up your battery and drive electric in the city. You know, for me, I, you know, on an environmental side, really love the idea of reducing inner city emissions. Look, I'm not the most well-educated environmentalist. I like electric cars because they're interesting and there's things to test and some are great and some overheat after two minutes and you know there's just this wide world of of oddities that I enjoy testing and figuring out but at the end of the day um, driving around a city or walking around a city and smelling exhaust well that can't be good for anyone so I'm all about reducing inner city emissions so charging up on the highway out in the country on the way to a city if you're not gonna stop and charge which just seems silly to do in a hybrid then uh, yeah I'm all for that type of situation thank you for letting us cut you off everyone because we're in a pull star um, there's also a hold functionality. So if you know, for example, the way I use this is charging up at home. I'm going to go to a track day. I'm going to go, it's not really a track day kind of car, but like I said, we have a track review. Uh, I'm going to go shred up a mountain road, which I do every morning, you know, in Colorado, I try and hit up the canyons as much as possible. Then I can use the hold functionality. It will keep the combustion engine on and it will do its best to not use the electric systems. Now, actually, when I drive on a quick road, I usually drive the cars in hold or charge mode to try and keep the battery topped up as much as possible. So at every opportunity, it's trying to stuff more energy back into the battery. And then at wide open throttle application, which sometimes I use, like on every straightaway, it's uh, gonna be giving me all the power it can regardless of the drive mode I've selected. So the real fast way to drive a Polestar 1, if you're gonna be going for sort of a long distance rip, going up Angeles Crest, for example, some, you know that's a good, good use case. I would go either charge mode or hold in power ESC Sport, and then it'll do its best under medium throttle and regen to charge up the battery, and then you just go past the kick down switch and you have everything all the time. So there's a little bit on the driving modes. In terms of the quietness, the car's built really well. This thing's got 10,000 miles, almost 9,300 miles. No squeaks or rattles. That's impressive to me because the car is so stiff when you have it turned up, you know, the Olean's turned up. And I don't know what journalists have been doing with this car, but I know every time I get a car from Volvo or Polestar with the Olean dampers, I'm always playing around with them, jacking the car up, changing stuff, feeling it out. Um, I don't know if others do that or not, but uh, I would imagine. So I'm sure this car's been through hell and back as a press car and it feels great. Literally no, not even ripples in the leather on the seat. It just seems so well cared for. And I feel like so excited to be the caretaker of this car today. And uh, as a GT, oh, the, you put the music up, the windows cracked a little bit just to get some of that fresh smoggy air in. And uh, <laughs> it's wonderful, wonderful to cruise in. But what I like about this car is really this three distinct personality of a everyday, just jump in electric mode, no engine warm up time, out the garage, you can pull up to the fast chargers, plug in and 
do all that. I mean, we can have a whole nother topic as to whether or not you should DC fast charge electric cars out in the wild, especially with station availability being limited and battery electric cars actually needing to charge. That's a whole nother conversation. However, it's nice to know you at least can. And I love just rolling into the throttle and feeling this nice mid-range torque. The numbers get very big very quickly and that was just touching the throttle really is nice to just cruise in like we're doing now in places like we are <laughs> what a special machine also I'd like to mention yes I mentioned it has DC fast charging I just wanted to show you this but um, can't actually activate the electrify America station not any fault of the pole stars it's just their app won't work on my phone uh, it loads the app, it shows the chargers, but it doesn't let me activate the individual ones. So more EA problems here, but at least uh, we don't need it. Thankfully, that would be a pain. It's actually the first time I haven't been able to activate an Electrify America charger with the app in a long time. Not sure if it has to do with the signal or not. Tesla Urban Supercharger back here. These are all 150 kilowatt units though. And man, is it so funny pulling up to a DC fast charger with the combustion engine on and this thing just looks so, so good, doesn't it? So weird. I've never seen one really out in the wild, maybe once, and I've definitely never seen one at a charging station. Anyway, let's keep going on with our drive. But I came past here, I was like, ah, oh, I gotta at least show you that it does plug in on CCS. So sometimes you can't get the EA stations to activate and no plug in charge on this particular car. But yep, there's your port right there. Pretty sweet. And I do have a full zero to 100% DC fast charging curve test on one of the channels. I'm sure you can just search it. I'm sure we're the only ones to ever do that with a Polestar, but it's out there in the internet somewhere. And now it's time to have some fun. Now I still have the suspension in full comfort because you actually need to jack up the rear to adjust. So we're gonna be going in full softy soft mode. Um, we're on a great road and uh, yeah, I won't say exactly what it is, but it's pretty, pretty spicy. We're gonna go into power for sporty driving. I'm then going to go over here. I'm gonna turn off the hybrid charge function. We're at just under 75% state of charge, about 70% state of charge. So if we were gonna be ripping, 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 then I would keep it in charge function like I mentioned, but I kind of want you know the full natural performance just for this little review. Then we're gonna go ESC sport mode on. I have it in B for off throttle regen, which pulls the rear for the most part, of course, being regen. So just need to be mindful of where the regen's coming from, of course. I think everything's situated nicely in the car, eh, for the most part. It's soft with the suspension, soft. And we are going to go opening it up. 6,500 RPM red line, paddle shifters here. Two ways to shift the gears. I believe it's an eight speed torque converter automatic. You can rock the shifter left or right, the little crystal, shift, crystal shifter, or you can use the up and down paddle shifters, downshifts. Let's see how smooth they are. Pretty good. Oh my goodness, there's like a biking situation going on here with a film crew. And I think they're pulling over for us. That's super nice of them. Yeah. We'll say thank you very much to those guys and back to power. Oh, it explodes down the straightaway. It is a surprising amount of power when you get this engine and hybrid systems on on oil and I think it's like the first hit when everything's kind of cool and the motors aren't super hot it always just feels a little bit more impressive than uh, maybe not this thing motor so there's no question it has enough power it's maybe a question of does it have enough thermal longevity we'll see not sure of the tires on this particular one pretty thin tires it's more of you know this car is very heavily focused on design more so than actual performance. But let's get this truck by and I'll talk about why it's so interesting to drive this car quickly. I've alluded to it earlier, but um, we'll do a little performance drive on this insane road. Let's start with a launch, but I'm not gonna brake boost it and try and get it into its like fast transmission shifting thing for zero to 60 times. Let's just nail it from a stop. Electric boost and oof. <laughs> it's so funny, just roast the front tires so much performance too. Back into B mode, downshift, third gear. Now this car does not hold at the rev limiter, which I wish it did, It, um, but it's actually not the end of the world because it makes so much torque everywhere that like throughout the rev range. Oh my goodness, this thing can go 
cover some ground. Now, is it as well sorted as a Porsche 911? Hell no. Is it so weird to be driving a Swedish safety mobile? You know, we think Volvo has safety cars and uh, Polestar, of course, being their performance aspect fast. Well, I've always loved doing it. I've been a Polestar fan since the you know beginning days, back, back when they were racing Volvos when they were their own tuning company. And then of course being acquired by Volvo as their performance arm and now being spun off as their own brand. The one thing that really bugs me about Polestar, and I've mentioned it uh, you know, a couple times on our weekly podcasts and whatever, is that they claim there's no heritage to the brand. They literally say in their showrooms, we have no history, we have no heritage or something like that. And to me, well, that's just a real shame because there is a lot of heritage with Polestar and it has to do with quick driving. I mean, at the end of the day, this, Polestar is probably one of the most important brands to Swedish driving enthusiasts. And, you know, to me, I'm a Volvo guy. I love fast wagons. You know, the, the Polestar V60 optimized type thing. These are like my dream cars. And to walk into a showroom and say, we have no heritage. Well, that's a little bit disappointing if I'm honest. Um, maybe you can hear a little bit of the tires talking back to me there. I mean, it just seems a bit under tired on the front axle. Uh, big, fat, meaty rear tires amazing road brake pedal feels awesome it's fully brake by wire so when i get into abs there is no feedback so here full abs yeah you just feel nothing in the pedal great abs tuning across all of uh polestar polestar 2 especially built on cma uses similar braking characteristics where you just get into the pedal it's very aggressive allowing quite a bit of wheel not necessarily lockup but lower speed rotation so it really gets you slowed down stuff it in yeah a little lift off oversteer on the way in that's what i like about keeping the rear in b mode kind of pulls the back around what a freaking road love this road and the suspension in soft is actually perfect can't believe how smooth the pavement is here too um it used to be like absolutely crazy um the uh, rear axle with the regen on the back is great because you just lift off and it helps just kind of pull the rear around a little bit on the power the front makes a lot more power than the rear axle so you're always kind of getting this front wheel drive biased performance out of corners and you just have to keep pulling the left paddle but <laughs> holy smokes is it just so nice to be able to come up here in the full star one <laughs> and take it for a drive it just feels like it loves this stuff right on the edge oh yes you would not want to go off to the right. That would be kind of a bad day, but thankfully we're just cruising. Nothing crazy. The four cylinder is fruity. It's not necessarily responsive. It just wants you to stay in it. Just keep your foot down. Tell it what you want. There we go. 6,500 RPM. So awesome. Just wants you to keep your foot matted. It doesn't love partial throttle. Suspension's still stiff in comfort, I gotta say. Car feels great. I almost probably would keep mine if I owned one in comfort all the time because you can let the car work on, around these types of surfaces and applying full acceleration. <laughs> wish it was a little bit louder, honestly. I wish this thing had an exhaust. There's a company called Heiko, I believe, Heiko Sportive. Uh, I think they're in Sweden. They make an exhaust for some of the Volvo stuff. I don't know about full start. <laughs> Coming in under braking, stuffing it in. Oh yes, maybe we're turning it up a little bit here. We gotta have fun once in a while, right? <laughs> oh yes, yes. This is what I like. This thing is insane. We were just cruising around in electric mode, and now we're up here absolutely shredding the piss out of this car. Oh, oh the balance is wonderful. And this is quite an interesting surface because it seems like it's rained up here. So you go grip to no grip to grip to no grip. And oh, oh, yes. Into second. Will it go into second? Nope, third. Sorry, it's got a lot of torque. Tight corners. Ah, rocks on the road. Let's not hit those. <laughs> Debris. So yeah, driving this thing quickly on this road is so special revving all the way out. I feel like we're losing a little bit of the electric assistance. I don't know if it's due to temperature or what exactly, but it could be just the gain in altitude as well for the combustion side. Doesn't feel as peppy as it did at the bottom, but don't get me wrong, this thing is still quick. 
and very well sorted in the corners. It's amazing how this chassis is so adaptable for different applications, but the way that this thing gets around a back road is stellar. Wow. Well, there you have it. A nice hard blast in the Polestar 1. What a treat. What a treat it was. What a day. I could just do this all day, every day. If I owned a Polestar 1, that's where I would be cruising through the wine country and then shredding up here in the hills, probably before the wine. <laughs> what a car. It also has driver assistance and good highway cruiser. This isn't a car to do a ton of miles in, although you certainly could do a cross-country trip. Um, yeah, this is a car to leave at the house in Napa, you know? And there's another Polestar 1 up ahead, actually. You want to join me for the drive, see if we can catch up to him? It's possible. Let's see. All right, the goal is to catch the Polestar 1 in the distance. We are full attack mode now. Let's go. <laughs> Put hard down. Dab a brakes on the way in, get the weight on the front. Throttle. Yeah, it's not the most responsive thing when you hit wide open. You get the electric motors and then the four cylinders got to catch up. But I love it. It's kind of a nice blend. I don't know who's driving the one in front, but oh, we are catching him with some vengeance, aren't we? Oh, yeah, that was easy. And let's end the video there. Thank you so much for joining me <laughs> for a drive in the Polestar 1. <laughs> little thank you there got a journalist to pull over for us that's a win see you on the next one bye bye